Thank you for being faithful in your tithes and in your offerings. And if you have any tithe or offering today, you could either give it in person, you could also give it online at the sanctuary UPC at hotmail.com. It's appreciated that you are faithful. I believe we serve a very faithful God. And if we remain faithful to Him, He'll always be faithful to us. Jesus, thank you for the gift, the giver today. Thank you, God, for those that are faithful. Lord Jesus and their commitments and the giving. Give them back, God, pressed down, shaking together and running over. We give thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Why don't you give somebody a hand wave say, so you know what? I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for coming. If you weren't here, you wouldn't be here. But you are here. We're together again. Amen. You have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 16. Book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to begin our reading this afternoon at verse number. 16. Book of Acts chapter 16, verse 16, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, and they drew them into the markets unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. Jesus, we love you. God, we praise you this afternoon. Thank you, God, for all those who have come and part of the service today. Let the Holy Ghost speak to us. God, open our ears to hear and hearts to receive what it is that you have for us we're quick to give you all the praise all the glory in that mighty in that maxless name of jesus christ we pray and everybody said amen amen god bless you may be seated i truly believe this this afternoon under the inspiration of god i want to preach to you a message titled we are here we are here our scriptural text, as we read, brings us to a time when Paul and Silas uh, were openly preaching before the people for a number of days, which during this time there was a certain damsel that was possessed with the spirit of divination. She used to be able to call times and, and events and that followed them daily as they preached. And the Bible says, but Paul, being grieved, he turned and he said to the spirit, not to the woman, he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out of her that same hour. Now Paul, having done this, immediately caused an uproar with the woman's masters, as it was they who now saw that the hope of their gains was gone. And so having caught them, they brought them before the rulers and the magistrates, declaring these men do exceedingly trouble our city, teaching customs that are not lawful for us to receive. And and hearing this, the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates, they rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, 
They cast them into prison, charging the, jail, the jailer pardon me, to keep them safely. Now, having both read and also reiterated this biblical account for you, what it is I want to stop and say to you is there's no doubt that throughout the ministry of not just Paul and Silas, but throughout the ministry of any of the disciples of Jesus who traveled from town to town preaching and proclaiming the gospel message, there's no doubt in my mind how that on any number of occasions, it would have been they who would have been both confronted and had been brought under the severe scrutiny by the rulers and the people that were before them. Right. So what I'm trying to say to you this afternoon is it would have no doubt been they who had found themselves facing and placed in adverse circumstances to where their life and of their freedom, that of their freedom, many a time probably was put at risk. And it was in reading this scriptural circumstance of Paul and Silas that God impressed upon my mind the thought with their having been beaten, put into prison, together as Paul and Silas looked at each other, maybe a thought that could have crossed their minds was, <laughs> we're here. We are here, in other words, for better, for worse, in the light of there, and shall I say, at many times, even in our own life circumstances, it's you. And I, shall I say, that even has been the one, a time or two, or maybe more than a time or two, that have been the ones to declare the same or similar words. We're here. We are here. And what the meaning and the purpose of our declaring such words is meant is this. In whatever state or circumstance in life that we find ourselves in, in our lives, as we live our lives for God, it is I who believes, church, that the most important factor in concerns to that of our circumstances, it lies in the fact of what we do, well, it is we who are in such circumstances. Mm -hmm. Meaning for, for us, just as it was for them, what was going to be really mattering to them most of all in the end is what they did, how they responded, what happened to them from that point, whether or not maybe they quit. And this is speaking of all and speaking of us. Maybe they turned back from their serving God, whether or not it was they who crumbled under the pressure of persecution or whether or not it was they or even you who instead who stands up to fight back declaring your pedigree. I'll stand for Jesus, whatever comes my way. I'll continue to fight that good fight of faith until Jesus, until the day that Jesus comes back and he takes me home. Amen. Now the Bible is full of instances where pe the people of God were up against the odds. They were outnumbered and surely there would have been or arisen situations and circumstances that would have not shown them any chance of a favorable outcome. Think in your minds back to the story of Daniel as he's being led off to the lion's den or maybe Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who with the soldiers are walking towards that fiery furnace. In other words, a favorable outcome and likely it was the last thing wherever they were found, wherever they found themselves would have been what was hoped for. I guess I'm going to die, be torn apart by lions. I guess our lives are going to be lost in a fiery furnace. And I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. In the circumstance that Paul and Silas found themselves in, as it was the magistrates who commanded to beat them and having laid many stripes upon them, casting them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. What does that mean? To ensure that they didn't escape. The jailer, no doubt in fear of receiving such a charge, the Bible says they thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stalks. So as the rulers and the magistrates were deciding what to do with Paul and Silas and in such a dismal circumstance of life, it could have been Paul and Silas who settled into the resolve that in just a short matter of time, it, their lives, would be over. We're going to die. They're going to kill us. But I submit to you this day that... <clears throat> That was not what rested in or within their minds, for as they sat there with bleeding backs and likely pain coursing through their bodies, having come into grips with the circumstance of, of not giving in to their situation in a spirit of defeat. Again, the Bible says at midnight, 
Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. They didn't sit there and boo-hoo and cry and figure we're going to be dead. No, they began to pray and to sing praises for God. And, and, and as you stop for just a moment to try to comprehend Paul and Silas's circumstance, beat, bleeding, held fast in, in the stocks, instead of moaning their present circumstance and wishing that they were able to be free, they began to pray and sing praises unto God. And, and maybe Paul looked over at Silas. He goes, hey, Silas, do you remember the chorus that goes something like this? It's real. It's real. I know, I know it's real. It's a Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. And maybe it was Silas after he was done singing that one says, yeah, and this next chorus, he brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on that rock to stay. He put a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. And so in a spirit of worship and praise together, they thank God for allowing them to suffer for his name and, and to be counted worthy to be the ones to proclaim Jesus' power and majesty in Jesus' name, locked in that inner prison. They didn't let it take them down and hold them out and make, oh man, it's over. No, they just started to praise God. And, and together it was they who were then creating such a stir. They created such a stir in the prison, the Bible says in Acts chapter 16 and 26, that suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately, immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. You can be in a circumstance of life where things are going south and everything's going wrong and people would look at you, oh man, I'm so sorry to hear about what you're going through. You say, yeah, guess what? I know that God's with me and I know that God's going to bring me through. I might be down, but I am not out. Amen. So it's Paul and Silas, they made the decision to pray, to sing praises to God. A choice. Yeah, yeah. Catch that, please. A choice, I say, that not only set them but all of the other prisoners free and the bible goes on to say in that same chapter how that a short while later the jailer and all his house were baptized in jesus Amen. name and so i submit to you this afternoon that wherever it is in life or life circumstance that brings us it's in and through our life circumstance that in order for us to be or to become more than conquerors in christ what we do and how it is that we react well, going through it, so to speak, is what's going to matter most of all. I believe as it was uh, Daniel, and they, they threw him into the lion's den, and, and when it was told in history, they usually starved those lions, and so when they got the, whoever was thrown in there, they ripped him to shreds. And so after Daniel laid down and, and used the, the mane of that lion as a pillow, and, and maybe tickling him and patted him under their ear, and, and went to sleep and woke up in the morning, and finally he was let out of that, out of that lion's den. And, and after they came to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fire and furnace and, yeah. and they looked and, and their bands were burnt off and there was no burning of their clothes and there was somebody else in there with them and they finally, would you come out of there? You know, we're kind of, we're just warming up. We're just warming up that their circumstance changed and, and, and they weren't left in the dismal uh, place that they were found but how they reacted, what they did in their circumstance mattered. See, it's the Apostle Peter who writes in 1 Peter, if you'd like to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Beginning at verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12. Peter writes, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with an exceeding joy. I just love going through it. I just can't get over. You know, in, in the disciples' day, when they would get beat up by the people or mob, maybe eggs or, 
apples thrown at him and, and they were driven out of their, their area from preaching and stuff. He got back, man, look at that. I got an apple to the side of the head. Yeah, got eggs all over the back of my jacket. Boy, this is what, oh yeah, that happened to you? Yeah, look at the stripes I got, boy. They, they counted it joy when they fell into trouble. They thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread that ever happened to them. And here we are, you know, well, well my, my finances, they're in the garbage can. My life situation looks hopeless. The trial that I'm in, it seems to just keep dragging on. And at times it feels like everything in my life is going in the wrong direction. Can I get a witness today? Been there, done that. Oh, is this ever going to stop? Is that pop bottle income ever going to turn into at least milk? <laughs> Something better? Is life going to change? You know, if you were asked maybe in such times as you've been through, how many times could you have honestly said, wow, I just don't know how much more I can take. I don't know how much more I can take. And maybe I should just quit, you know. Throw in the towel and go back into the world and give up on God. Well, come on, Pastor. It looks, sounds like you just quit at preaching and now you've gone to meddling. Because you know what? As humanity, surely it might have felt that way. I had enough. I don't want to go through this anymore. I'm sick and tired of being broke. I'm tired of going from paycheck to paycheck and week to week and, yeah. and, and struggling. Why can't things change? See, it's the truth, saints. It really is. Mm -hmm. Friends, today it's the truth. Yeah. Too many times it's we who allow life circumstances to overwhelm us. Instead of us taking the bull by the horns, instead of us setting our faces like a flint and taking the challenge that's before us head on. Declaring, I plead the blood of Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah. Being confident in the fact that if God is for me, then I say who it is that can be against me. Instead of just sitting back and crying in your milk and your sugar waiting for a piece of cheese with your wine, and you said, no, 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 I got the Holy Ghost. I, God saved me. He, he didn't bring me this far just to leave me. This is not how it's going to end. Amen. So there's an old saying that goes like this. It's not how many times you fall down that matters, but how many times you get back up. That's right. You need to catch that. Not how many times you fall down. You know how many times in 40 years I fell down? Now, how many times throughout my life, walking with God, things were adverse, things were against me. I'm talking jobs, I'm talking finances, I'm talking people and different things in life. And you just think, well, wow, it's just like a barrage and it's coming down on me. But guess what? It wasn't how many times I fell down. It was how many times I said, you know what? Brush my knees off, get up and start walking, stay on that path. Keep my eyes on that goal. Live for God. Do what I know what I need to do. And God will take it from there. See, throughout the Old and New Testament, it's you who will find God's people up against the odds. Those who were outnumbered, those who were in danger of losing their lives, and at the same time, and on many occasions, it's you who can read about how it was they in their situation or circumstance were the ones who, through God, were able to see their circumstance turned around. Like I said, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Peter, when he was in prison and the people were over the church praying, Oh God, set Peter free. It's just terrible. They're going to kill him in the morning. It's, just, oh, it's over. I just can't believe it. We all love Peter. And the angel got him out of that prison. He goes back to where they were and he's knocking on the door. Rhoda goes downstairs and, Who's there? It's me. Ah! Oh no. And she runs back upstairs. Who's at the door? It's a ghost or something. It's Peter, and he continues knocking. We wonder, oh well, boy, the circumstance, and then it's just terrible. Then the check comes in the mail. Then something happens at your job. You get a raise, and you find that you're going to get more money. Or, or somebody gives you a gift of a gas card or a food card. Or something happens, and it turns around instead of going, oh, man, I can tell you how terrible it was. And you can say, bless God, I can tell you how great it is. Look what God did. Look how he changed it. Our son's down in California, and, and I know it rains on the just and the unjust, don't get me wrong, but I still have faith in God. And so he was talking about there's going to come high winds and floodwaters and all this kind of stuff, and it's going to be really bad, 60 mile an hour winds. And, and so he sends us a text, and he said that, you know, the, 
the power went out and he said in our area the power came back on and I sent him a reply and I said thank you God I said that's God that's God working for his kids he said you know when the floods came it went all around us but it didn't didn't get us go back to the story of Egypt what happened in the land of Goshen in the land of Goshen the people all around in Egypt were getting pounded and the people in the land of Goshen were there were just living their life and you say well how come how come even though it rains on the just and the unjust how come you always get over it how come everything in your life seems to go ahead and be fine I'll tell you why because I got God on my side and you know and sometimes sometimes God lets me go to it Sometimes I get down in that trial and that valley of life, but ahead of me, hear me now, ahead of me there's coming my mountain, ahead of me is coming my victory, ahead of me is coming that time when I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to move forward. Amen. See, have you ever stopped for a moment to consider the story of Joseph? Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, he was cast into prison by Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, for a wrongdoing he never committed. Mm -hmm. In prison, Joseph, however, was used by God to help a baker and a butler with their dreams and the interpretation of, but who, for whatever reason, it was Joseph who was still left to continue to rot in prison when they, the butler and the baker, got out. Now, Joseph, he didn't really do anything wrong, and maybe he was left feeling, you know, what's God's purpose? Anybody feel like that before? Why am I going through this? What do I need to learn? I asked my pastor many years ago, I said, you know, how come I keep seeming to go through the same kind of trial all the time? He said, next time you go into that trial, he said, stop. And he said, well, you're praying? He said, God, what do I need to learn? Goldfish in the bowl, you want to get out of that bowl? Maybe stop and say, God, teach me what I need to learn so I can go forward. Amen. So maybe you thought, you know, what's God's purpose? Am I going through all of this? Why do I have to be left forgotten by those who I, I helped? And yet all the while, it was Joseph, we're going to find out real quick, who never lost his faith in his God. And so I declare to you today that Joseph might have been given up for dead by his brothers. He may have been mourned by his father, but his attitude and his resolve, it was Joseph who was not foolish enough to get into the blame game, and especially when it came to his blaming God. Yes. When adverse situations happen, you know, people do, they blame God. They don't pick on the devil, they blame God. God did this. Maybe God allowed it, but the devil did this. You know, you wonder how, how come things happen? Well, God did it, that's why. And so, but Joseph, he, you know what he didn't do? He didn't sit there, I'm gonna pick on God, but according to the story of Joseph, all the while he was made to go through it, the trial of his faith, it was Joseph who held on to this attitude. Well, since we or I am here, and might be, I might as well make the best of it. And because of his attitude, in a very short order, it was God who used Joseph as it was God who had a plan in Joseph's life. Do you know when you go through a trial, let me show this with you. When you go through a trial and something happens, something adverse to your life, and, and you, you're made to struggle, maybe things aren't great and finances are low, or, uh, or just whatever it could be, and instead of you know, boo-hoo and pouting, maybe just wonder that maybe down the road someone's going to come to you and say, you know what? I'll tell you what, right now, I'm going through it. It's just bad. I'm going to tell you all. And so they sit there and tell you, and, and you smile at them. They go, what are you smiling at? I was there too. I went through that same thing. And this is what God did for me. Amen. And this is what you need to do yes. as well. You need to pray and put your faith and your trust in God. Amen. So Genesis, let's turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Let's go back to the beginning, kids. <coughs> folks Genesis chapter 41 <coughs> we're going to begin our reading at verse number 1 here the Bible says and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed a dream and behold he stood by the river now let's stop right here let's stop for a moment to say how how that I don't know about you but for many Two full years. That would likely have been time for them or maybe even you to give up on God, to give up on your life. 
Two years after watching the butler and the baker walk out of the prison, there sat Joseph, forgotten. As Joseph sat in the cell, maybe it was he who wondered, well, well we're here, using the personal pronoun to identify himself. I guess we're here in, in, in this life circumstance. Two years later. So I may as well do what I know I can do and hang on to the hope and pray that God one day will look down upon me with his favor. Amen. Let's go back to the scriptures, verse number two. And behold, there came upon that river, this is the Pharaoh, remember? There came upon that river seven well-favored kind and f uh, fat flesh, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind come up after them out of the river, ill-favored and, and lean flesh shed. And they stood by the other kind and upon the brink of the river and the ill-favored and the lean-fleshed kind. They did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. And so Pharaoh woke, woke and, he, and he slept and he dreamed the second time. And behold, seven years of corn came upon one stalk and rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprung upon after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and the full ears. And Pharaoh woke and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that can interpret them unto Pharaoh. Let's go down to verse number nine. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and he put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, and I and he, we dreamed, and each man according to his interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, an Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according of his dream did interpret. Verse number 14. Then Pharaoh sent and he called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and he came in unto Pharaoh and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it and I have heard of, say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Watch this. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So now instead of even allowing his circumstance to be his end, it was Joseph who patiently waited and used his time for the purpose of being a blessing to others. And in the end, it was God who turned and yes. used Joseph to save God's people yes. in the midst of a severe famine, if you were to keep on reading. But for time, we'll bypass that. And so today, the same could be said of the 120 who obeyed Jesus' command for them to go and to tarry in Jerusalem in an upper room until. It was 120 who tarried for whatever number of days before it was God who poured out upon them, upon them all, the, the promise of the Holy Ghost. Now there's no record of their discussion as they walked into the upper room, but my thought is this, that their attitude was, well, you know, we are here. We're here and we all know what God has promised. So together let's do what it is that we know we need to do. And in due time the Holy Ghost was poured out. And because of the 120's willingness to tarry in the day in which we live church. It's the promise of God that's still being poured out upon the seeking and the searching and the hungry souls. Who in their lives are also willing to tarry until. Yeah. And now. Church, friends, let me bring this thought home. Let me bring it home right here to the people of the Sanctuary Church in Williams Lake. Right here and right now. In this new year of 2023, all I can say to you loud and clear is all, to all of you is, we're here. We, 2023, eight days into it, we are here. We are here. We have arrived, a new day has dawned, another year is upon us, and here we sit with a new church name, with a renewed purpose, a purpose of our church desiring and wanting to experience none other than a great outpouring of the Spirit of God Amen. upon us. 
That's what we do church for. We not only want to have church so we can be blessed, we want others to be blessed and to join us in the church house. We want to see God pour out a spirit. We're looking for what? A revival. A revival in us and a revival in concerns to the influx of new souls Amen. being born into the kingdom of Amen. God. And so as I said in the onset of this message, thought in our understanding that fact, that yes, yes, we are here. We hear the most important factor in concerns to our present circumstances. It lies in the fact of what we do in the days and in the weeks and in the months that lie ahead. If we really want a revival, if it's you who truly desires to grow, grow deeper in God and experience a mighty revival in Jesus' name before he returns, we now have crossed on and over into this new year. And I believe that what we do and what we determine to do as a church, where we go from this time forward, all of us, all of us need to understand what we do is going to matter most of all. Yes. So I guess, church, what I'm saying to you is this. We can continue on with the status quo. Just keep doing what we've always been doing. <clears throat> we can do as we've always been doing or together. We can decide to take the ball and run with it. By all of us doing everything that we know that we need to do in order to experience all that God has Amen. in his pleasure awaiting us. You think about it. We can, oh, let's just have church. Let's just show up for Bible study. Let's just go through uh, prayer and fasting. Let, let's just show up for prayer meeting Tuesdays. Let's just, and just keep doing it and doing it. And no, or we can say, you know what? There's a whole lot more out there for us. The Sister Zossman comes today. We all know that our jobs as well as our personal life issues, along with other distractions such as health issues, etc., have all had their way of getting in the way of what it is that God through us wants to do. And as your pastor, I believe that the time has come for us, church, to pull out the stops and to put our focus on what it is that God has called us to do. God's called us to be soul winners. God's called us to share our life. God's called us to Amen. share the testimony and tell them what Jesus has done for you. Meaning every time that also we gather together the thought that needs to be in all of our minds is, well, we're here. We are here. Whether it is a prayer meeting, a midweek Bible study, Sunday morning service, Sunday afternoon service, since the fact is, yeah, we are here. Can you understand that today? We're here. We're here together in the spirit of unity. It's we, church, who needs to be the ones to take advantage of every opportunity that we have and give God 100%. When we come to church, it's not sit to listen, but it's sit to learn. It's sit to praise God, to get into that song service, lift up our hands and worship Him, clap our hands. It's time for us to get outside of this church. Oh, look at you. You look really nice. Where have you been? Oh, well, uh, this morning, you know, I got up and combed my hair and stuff. No, I was at church. And, oh, well, what church you go to? I go to the sanctuary church. And, oh, well, well, where is that? I had a person say that to me the other day. Dave McCart and said, you know, you need to come and join us at the sanctuary. I, I, mean, I know you'll enjoy our service. And, and, and every time we come... Anything that we do this year, it's 100%. This year, we do it with the spirit and attitude. We're here. We're going through this month by month, week by week, yes. yeah, until the entire end of this year. We're going to do what we can do. Mm. Amen. Come on. Let's stand together today. 2023, church, can be a year of revival, a year of renewal, the year of new beginnings for those who are new to this walk with God. We're here. We're here today, church, and it's God who's for us. Yes. And in closing this afternoon, I want to say this. Together, let's give it everything we've got and allow God to do the rest. Next week's prayer and fasting, well, it's a perfect time to set our course toward revival. We show up together. We pray together. We purpose together. And as we pray with unity being first, I believe there's the benefits that will follow. As we pray, we fast, we expect, we believe, we seek God. And this watch what unfolds in this new year in 2023. Today I want to cast a vision. Today I want you to see, not here today, but the next tomorrow and the days after that. I want you to look ahead and see the church full. It looks really nice this afternoon to see the people here. 
but wouldn't it be great to see it double and then maybe a few months later triple? Remember I talked about at the end of last year, a 50 soul revival? Who says it can't come to beats? Who says we can't reach out into our city and do what we know we need to do in Jesus' name? Why don't you put your hands in the air? Why don't you begin to talk to God? Say, God, I want to see it. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a church that's on fire. I want to be a soul of God that's reaching and doing what it is that we know that we need to do. I believe it's time to pray. And I believe it's time to trust God. And put our faith in Him and say, God, use me. Work through me. Move through me. Help me to be a witness.